Hello, everybody. Welcome back to our series of podcasts called Menninger Mindscape. It's wonderful to have our guest today, Dr. Richard McNally. Rich, welcome. Thank you. Delighted to have you. Uh, Dr. McNally is professor of psychology at Harvard, and he's director of clinical training in psychology, and a researcher uh, and an expert in a really interesting area. He's going to talk about this at a symposium we're holding tomorrow on trauma, and the title of his talk is Trauma and Memory. And he's done some really interesting research. He's written a whole lot, gotten lots of honors. One of the things he wrote was a book called Remembering Trauma, which is right on target with what he's going to talk about tomorrow. So we have a chance just to have a few little preview of coming attraction headlines today, and we'll hear more about it tomorrow. So Rich, tell us a little bit about this work that you're doing. Well, the, the, the work that I'll be talking about uh, tomorrow, really, uh, I've just uh, sort of selected three different studies that, that sort of span some of the more recent things that we've done. Um, one of them deals with uh, the issue about the recovered memory controversy. Uh, and uh, we did a lot of work with individuals who had reported recovered memories of sexual abuse in particular in our lab. We did a lot of experimental studies to try to understand how memory functioning works in these individuals compared to those people who've never forgotten uh, that they had been uh, sexually abused and control subjects and people who believe they harbored repressed memories that they couldn't recall. You're, but, you're saying that mm -hmm. very quickly as if that sounds easy, but it doesn't sound easy. It sounds to me like that must have been very challenging. Well, actually, it was, it was quite interesting because we were doing a research with a neuroimaging, actually, with mm -hmm. childhood sexual abuse survivors. And uh, uh, so this is some years ago. We were using PET scans back then mm -hmm. and not fMRI. But um, we had uh, women who had responded to some of her ads posted in the Boston Globe mm -hmm. and places like that seeking adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse and some of them had volunteered to participate in the project but they had no memories of the trauma, they had no autobiographical memories and so this gave me the idea to say, wow, here's an opportunity mm -hmm. to, we couldn't use those people in the scanning study obviously, I recorded autobiographical memories mm -hmm. of trauma but we embarked on a whole series of studies on people who, who um, we initially thought they had been abused, thought they had harbored these repressed memories, but then we studied this, all of these groups. But uh, uh, to cut to the chase, one of the things that came out of this really is I think another interpretation of the phenomenon of recovered memory. Uh, uh, at the time we embarked upon this project, uh, there were sort of two opposing views of this matter. One was that Traumatic events in virtue of the fact that uh, the stress hormones that are released at such times sort of make the memory highly memorable indeed and often intrusive as in the case of post-traumatic stress mm -hmm. disorder. Uh, and so if someone claimed to have completely forgotten something that was presumably a trauma, they must be mistaken. That must be a false memory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, th then they have uh, other individuals who believe that the mind protects itself by banishing memories of trauma because they are so traumatic, mm -hmm. sealing them away in such a way that they can only be unearthed with certain therapeutic techniques when the person was ready to do it. The so-called repressed memory of trauma. Idea. Two plausible explanations, but very different. Very, very different explanations. I think we had some uh, evidence for the first and not much for the second, but then what sort of emerged as we were working with uh, uh, one particular one of our last cohorts of these individuals that there seemed to be a third interpretation of recovered memories. Uh, one that is, has nothing to do with repression, nor actually to do with trauma in the narrow sense of the word. We had individuals who reported having been sexually abused, molested typically, uh, you know, uh, fondled in some oral genital contact, but it never involved violence, never involved threats or terrors. It often involved somebody that they knew, a stepfather, grandfather. The kids were only seven years old at the time, but, and um, they didn't understand it. They had no concept for it. Uh, and then the perpetrator dies. Uh, they move to a new neighborhood. They just forget about it. It was uncomfortable. It was anxiety provoking. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, uh, but it was creepy. And they knew it was wrong sometimes because the perpetrator would say, shh, don't tell anybody about this. This is how I show that I love you. And the kid's wondering, nobody does this. This, this, is, not, this is weird. You know? But it's not the sort of thing as a brutal rape, mm -hmm. the sort of terrifying trauma that provokes the stress hormones that would render such an experience vivid and intrusive for years.
years later. And then we don't think about it for many years. And then they encounter some reminder. Uh, and boom, they say, oh my God, I, I remember my grandfather or uncle doing these sorts of things. That's what he was doing when I was sitting on his lap and he was mm -hmm. touching me. So mm -hmm. like, I'm a sexual abuse survivor. We're related. This is incest in the broad sense of the word. And would one version of this be what's referred to as the recovered memory syndrome? Well, I, I think you know, they would in fact qualify for a recovered memory. Mm -hmm. But here's the catch. At the time the event happened, it wasn't traumatic in the mm -hmm. narrow yeah, sense right, of the word right. of provoking terror. And during the long period of time when the memory apparently never came to mind, we have no evidence that it was blocked or repressed because it was so traumatic. Indeed, it wasn't. And then when they encountered some reminder, they recall it like that. It's not as if it had to be you know, painstakingly sort of pried loose, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, buried deep into the mind, nothing of that sort. Then, once they recover this memory, once they, they recall this and interpret it through the eyes of an adult for the first time, realizing that they were in fact sexually molested, that somebody was sexually exploiting them, somebody that they trusted. Mm -hmm. And now about a third of them were having PTSD symptoms, yeah, which in fact was a delayed onset PTSD in very virtue of the fact that they uh, now s understand what had happened. And so here's the irony of this. Yes, they forgot it for a long period of time, but not because it was so traumatic. Rather, they forgot about it because it wasn't so traumatic. They didn't understand it, and they didn't encounter reminders until later in adulthood. And when they did, it came to mind without any difficulty, without any sort of inhibition or repression being relevant. So I think that some of the cases that have surfaced in this controversy over these years are actually like that. Mm -hmm. It's not a false memory, mm -hmm. and it's not a traumatic memory that was repressed because it was so traumatic. Indeed, it wasn't traumatic. But once the person recalls it, interprets it through the eyes of adult, now they're traumatized. And so when you see these people clinically, they're highly distressed. And so the inference is, ah, uh, finally the, the lid of repression was broken, mm -hmm. but the reason why it was forgotten was because they were suffering from these stress symptoms. Doesn't seem to be the case. And the precipitant that would lead to the remembering mm -hmm. would be nothing dramatic necessarily? No, nothing, not necessarily. So for example, a friend may have, uh, have disclosed uh, to one of the subjects, oh, I think my uh, daughter might be molested or something happened like this, or they've gone to an AA meeting and someone says, uh, my name is uh, Jane Doe and I'm an alcoholic and let me tell my story. And they describe something that is similar to the, this, our subject's experience. And bingo, they just, oh my God, that's right, I've totally forgotten that. That's what was going on. And so I think that, so there's, and this is not a matter of a middle of the road interpretation. You know, some of these recovered memories are false, some of these are repressed traumatic memories. Rather, it's something qualitatively mm -hmm. distinct. Mm -hmm. Another interpretation of a phenomenon that's often mistaken is one of the other two. Now, how often would you get pushback? In what sense? Well, people arguing that, um, number one, how can you prove this? Number two, maybe there really was trauma. That's still repressed. Uh, and the memory comes back, but it wasn't just smooth sailing ever since it happened. And this wasn't a loving trajectory of no emotional importance, um, but maybe that's just not coming to the surface yet. Mm -hmm. And then number, <clears throat> the third question would be, assuming that in fact this is a unique category, mm -hmm. I think it's a very mm -hmm. interesting um, observation. How does it make a difference? What Does it guide us that we need to do something unique with this population to try and help? Is it different from um, other types of abuse and post-traumatic experiences? Well, the, 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 uh, there's a number of uh, questions you ask here. Yeah. Let's see if I can sort of take it from the top. And uh, in terms of uh, um, the, um, the notion that uh, maybe there's something worse that, that, that still that is repressed and things of, of this sort, um, we, uh, the, our largest group of people that we worked with over the years, were, we call them the continuous memory, uh, and almost invariably, not all, I shouldn't say all of them, but most of the time, they had experienced things that were objectively by any standard much worse. Mm -hmm. um, 
and they never forgot it. And, and they would often say, you mean to tell me some of your subjects say they forgot these things? You gotta be kidding. I wish I could forget it. Yeah. You know? um, and then you've got a whole very large body of work when we've had actually documented, corroborated traumatic events and you don't find people forgetting those, ones that are really severe. Mm -hmm. And so the, the repression thing doesn't seem to be all that, uh, that convincing. I think the reason why it's important, however, is that when you see that there are actually three categories of this phenomena, right. and, and when we define this phenomena as a recovered memory, we're doing this in a very atheoretical, descriptive mm -hmm. sense. Someone reports having been sexually abused, then they report a long period of time where they didn't think about it, and they report now thinking about mm -hmm. it. Period. It's nothing, it has nothing to do with mechanism, just right. a description. You know, well, how do you account for this? We've only had two popular explanations for this. And I think the third one sh shows that a sort of a resolution, you might say, to this controversy that doesn't rely on the concept of repression or the presupposition that the event was traumatic when it occurred. It was traumatic later when the person understand exactly what the exploitation was about. Because when a kid's seven years old, it's, it's um, especially our cohort, was a little bit older. Yeah. They were not exposed to the internet and all this, this sort of a thing. And so they were completely naive when they were being uh, exploited. Yeah, it's, it's a, a very interesting um, and, and clarifying uh, sort of picture. Do you feel that once these patients then realize the abusive nature mm -hmm. of those early experiences and then become symptomatic in some ways. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, how do they respond to treatment? Is it, are they able then to get through it or is it pretty mm -hmm. uh, tough to get a response that's helpful? Well, I, you know, I should, I should specify that these were not our own patients, yeah. uh, you know, because we were recruiting from the greater Boston, Cambridge okay. area. And uh, many of them had been in psychotherapy at various points of their lives, including some of them today. Um, very rare, uh, by the way, I would, I would point out that they were in so-called recovered memory mm -hmm. therapy, that, that sort of a thing. Um, but, um, and, and so that wasn't really the objective of our, of our, our research program. Uh, that's not what we were doing. Right. We're sort of right. studying cognitive functioning yeah, sure. and these different types of uh, um, presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, different, and um, so I really can't answer that. Okay. Uh, but, but, but the sort of... Um, uh, the sort of therapeutic procedures that have some evidential basis would be the ones that one would recommend that they um, that they have cognitive and behavioral therapies, for mm -hmm. example. I mean, because uh, some of the people have uh, occasionally would, would say, well, uh, you know, all sorts of imputations of guilt and that they were somehow complicit, that, complicit in some, in right, some way, right. and, and yet they don't even understand what the heck is going on. Mm -hmm. They're going to be complicit. Of course, perpetrators would have no problem right. making that claim, but. Um, so, uh, so, so I think it's important in, in showing that there's a way out of this. I mean, I, I think there are, there are clearly false memories. I think there's no controversy about that. But, but, but to believe that everybody who has that sort of a pattern I just described necessarily has a false memory or a repressed one, I think is a mistake. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to stop with just the last thought about this. Um, it seems to me it's not necessarily totally categorically black or white, and mm -hmm. so that there may have been some level of discomfort somewhere mm -hmm. close to the surface over time, and you've kind of said that, I think. So in some ways, this could be a relief enormously because it validates what had been hard to understand, but puts it into a clear, understandable context. Then maybe it's traumatic, with its impact, mm -hmm. but I would wonder if it turns out to then be possible to get beyond it later on mm -hmm. uh, as time goes by or with some other treatments. So that's another study. Uh, yeah, we did that study. <laughs> well, actually, what one related to that on uh, the so called centrality of events. Mm -hmm. what we, this is of a later cohort, and uh, the, uh, there's sort of an idea to, to the extent to which somebody sees the traumatic event is sort of a milestone in their life, sort of a marker, a self-defining self mm -hmm. sort of an experience that's completely integrated into their autobiography. To the extent, and, and to the extent they sort of see the future and see other experiences through the lens of that trauma, mm -hmm. a trauma survivor. Um, to the extent that's the case, we find out the more severe the PTSD symptoms, which, you know, so, the, so they're not moving beyond it so much. They've sort of integrated mm -hmm. it in a way that is, perhaps not uh, the best in some sense. They haven't really fully processed it and moved 
beyond it in some sense. Uh, and so I think that having identifying yeah. with the trauma to that extent could be a, be a problem. Yep. Yeah. Well, there's a whole lot more we could talk about. We're going to have to stop today, but I hope we'll have time for more questions and you'll be describing this in more detail tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So thanks for the headlines. <laughs> and, okay. Uh, look thank forward you. to hearing more tomorrow. And thank you all for joining us. Um, see you next time. <laughs>